Uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, welcome you to the Baker Institute this evening for a presentation on the challenges and opportunities facing U.S.-Iran relations. Uh, this is obviously a very timely and important topic. We are in a new and complex uh, period in the U.S.-Iran relationship. More than a year has now passed since the signing of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the so-called DEAL to reduce the risk posed by the Iranian nuclear program. And perhaps, while definitely not part of the deal, to begin a long process of trying to narrow the divisions between Iran and the United States. Despite some hope for a new era of U.S.-Iran relations, deep challenges and distrust remain. There is opposition to the nuclear deal and skepticism over Iranian intentions. And the opposition to the nuclear deal, as our speaker, I'm sure, will note, is not only here in the U.S., but in Iran also. So Iran's include a growing influence across the region, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, and beyond, is often at odds with U.S. regional interests. So in Iran, the uh, domestic political drivers which allowed the negotiations to take place now seem to be in some question. Many Iranians are frustrated as the anticipated economic benefits of the deal have not fully materialized. A number of incidents have increased bilateral tensions and aggressive rhetoric continues. So this is the landscape the next U.S. administration will face and inherit. <coughs> the Middle East is in its most tumultuous state in decades with Iran now playing a rather outsized role. However, some groundwork has been laid for a more pragmatic relationship based on mutual interests. The next president's decisions toward Iran may affect the Middle East for decades to come. So in this context, we are truly honored to have our distinguished speaker, Dr. Vali Nasser, with us this evening. Vali is no stranger to the complexity of Middle East diplomacy. I'm sure you've seen him on CNN and the airwaves. He's a frequent commentator on issues involving the region. He is currently the Dean of the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, DC. From 2009 to 2011, he served as special assistant to the late Ambassador Richard Holbrook, a mutual friend of ours, who was one of our most uh, distinguished and effective diplomats. Uh, during his time uh, as the President's Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, Vali is a prominent scholar, author, and foreign policy advisor. His most recent book, which I highly commend, which details his work with the State Department is Dispensable Nation, American Foreign Policy in Retreat. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ali Nasser. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Jerijian, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's, it's wonderful being back in Houston and I'm also very uh, happy to be visiting the Baker Institute for the first time. Uh, although I have to say one has to come with trepidation uh, uh, into an uh, institution which is uh, run by uh, an established old hand on the Middle East and also Secretary Baker, both of whom represented a, a tremendous period of stability and, and, and uh, a very clear and firm American policy uh, towards the Middle East. Um, uh, the Iran deal, uh, um, you know, has 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 been the subject of a of a lot of discussion uh, since the negotiations began uh, in a surprise uh, uh, in uh, the end of the first term of the Obama administration, and since then it has been the subject of debate, and it will likely to become uh, an important discussion point once there is a new administration uh, in place. I think that there is a still a lot of debate about the, the nature of the deal itself, uh, but also what the deal meant and what it still might mean, not just for U.S.-Iran relations, but also for the broader Middle East. 
So about the deal itself, uh, you know, the, the contours of it uh, were, were fairly uh, simple. That the U.S., uh, j particularly during the first term of President Obama, escalated sanctions against Iran after an initial attempt to engage uh, um, with the Ahmadinejad uh, government in Iran on the nuclear deal. When that failed, the U.S. used President Obama's newly found international authority and support to escalate uh, sanctions on Iran. The purpose of the sanctions was very clearly sold to all of America's allies to bring Iran to the table, not that Iran would necessarily give up the right to enrichment. And uh, at some point, the Iranians decided that they were going to um, test this proposition. Uh, there was a secret meeting uh, in Oman, first time, between very high-level uh, Iranian uh, representatives, including uh, the Iranian Supreme Leader's top foreign policy advisor, and also senior State Department officials. In those meetings, I think they, they agreed to certain rules of the game. Uh, one of the things they agreed to was that uh, the deal could not be about uh, Iran permanently giving up nuclear capability, because if that was the purpose of the deal, they would actually never get to an agreement. They would be negotiating for decades to come. But a, a, a temporary suspension was something that Iran could negotiate with and the US perhaps could consider. And this is actually one of the most controversial parts of the deal, the fact that it's not a permanent deal. It's a 15-year deal in the eyes of the US. It's a 25-year deal in the eyes of Iran. And that's important because, in our view, Iran can resume research and building of centrifuges after 15 years. But for, for 25 years, the international community has cradled to grave oversight over Iran's use of uranium, which uh, in some ways would make it very difficult for them to build the program for 25 years. But it's a temporary deal. And I think the second element that came out of that meeting was that it was very difficult for any American politician to actually negotiate with Iran's president at the time. And I think the Iranians understood that, and that was one of the reasons why uh, the supreme leader in Iran and, and the conservatives stood aside and allowed uh, Iran's uh, current president get elected with what, with, with what was seen as a very clear mandate. In other words, he won the presidential election outright, round one, with a majority vote, which gave him uh, the authority to negotiate. The negotiations went on for a while. The negotiations were themselves very significant, particularly on the Iranian side, because they broke a number of very major taboos in Iranian politics. I think even the image of a Secretary of State of the United States talking directly with an Iranian foreign minister was a sort of a shock to the Iranian system. It was far more significant. In, uh, uh, in Iran than it is, uh, in, was in the, in the United States. And, I, and, and that actually had an had a impact on I Iranian uh, body politic. Um, the deal eventually was signed. Uh, according to the terms of the deal, Iran would suspend its uh, nuclear enrichment program for, for, for a period of 15 years. It would ship out of the country 90% uh, of the 20% enriched uranium that it had, it had produced. And that's actually pretty important, because getting from 0 to 20% is the most difficult and arduous part of the enrichment process. And, and, and that, even in terms of market value, was a huge amount of uranium enriched, uh, semi-enriched uranium that they were going to ship out. They agreed to dismantle uh, m most of the cascades of their centrifuges, put them on a lock and barrel monitored by the International Atomic Energy Association, and also agreed to completely dismantle their plutonium uh, uh, processing facility, which they had created, which was a particular source of ir irritation to the international community, because unlike uranium, plutonium is much more for military purposes. There's, there's really no civilian use for enriched uh, uh, plutonium. They also agreed to open varieties of other uh, um, facilities for international inspection. In return, the US uh, agreed to uh, unfreeze 
uh, uh, money that Iran had frozen in international banks. Some of this money went back to military aircraft that uh, during the Shah's period Iran had ordered uh, in the United States. The aircraft was never de delivered, but the money was sitting in foreign banks. Some of the money was frozen. Uh, uh, oil revenue that Iran had accumulated over the past uh, decade before that was also sitting in banks. And, and also that uh, other sanctions specifically for nuclear issue that were um, passed in, um, in the United Nations, not so much in the US Congress, but, but the, uh, the nuclear-related sanctions that were passed at the United Nations would also be uh, 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 lifted. Now, uh, the significance of the deal for the Iranians was that uh, they, they thought they resolved an important uh, uh, international issue that was blocking their economic progress. So Iran's economy was languishing under sanctions. It has high rate of unemployment. It, it, it has a high rate of inflation. Its productivity had declined. And, and ultimately, uh, its economy was in an untenable position, and it needed to get out of the sanctions. Uh, it, it also was very significant to the Iranians and the international community that this deal, it would be the very first time that a country would come out of Chapter 7 sanctions of the United Nations without war. So, I mean, you know, as countries get sanctioned, and you, you know, the, the highest level is, is Chapter 7 according to rules of the Security Council, which is an authorization for even military action against the country. That was actually the, the tool that ultimately supported the war in Iraq at the United Nations. Iran was under Chapter 7 sanctions, uh, but uh, ultimately this deal would allow them to come out of Chapter 7. Now, what was in it for the United States? Uh, I think, at a very narrowly thought, uh, President Obama was clearly not interested in a war in the Middle East. I mean, you know, since the day he came to, to office, he was trying to extricate the United States from military engagement in the Middle East. And I think in Syria, we've seen that he has doggedly resisted even getting close to suggestions of uh, involvement in the Middle East. And I think there were many others, including even, I would say, in the security establishment in Israel that didn't think war was a really good option or that it was an extremely dangerous option. I mean, any time, especially after our experience in Iraq, you think of going to war with a country of 80 million people whose capital city is 2,000 miles and two mountain ranges away from the closest port you have to sort of pause and think where you're going. And, and, and the military men in the US would say there's no such thing as a, as a surgical strike. You can decide how you start a war. You cannot decide how you end the war. So once you struck Iranian sites, once, once the military option had happened, the ball would be really in the Iranian court. And did you want to take that risk? And I think the administration decided it didn't want to take that risk. At the same time, the sanctions had reached the maximum amount they could go. And so this was a way out for, for the United States to essentially take the war in the Middle East option off the table, right? Which is, I think, something President Obama sees as critical to his legacy. Uh, ending the wars that were going on and not starting new ones, whether it's in Syria or, or, or in, it's in Iran. So it viewed it as a major gain. And also, I think uh, it removed to a good extent the Iranian uh, immediate threat. So the language of they're six months away from a bomb, they're a, mu they're, 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 they're a year away from the bomb, you know, that clearly is not the case. Even people who complain about the nuclear deal complain that it is not permanent, that it has a 15-year you know, clause on it, or that it doesn't deal with uh, terrorism, or it doesn't deal with human rights issues. But in reality, you haven't heard in the past two years anybody, including you know, the Prime Minister of Israel, say that you know, within six months, Iran's going to have a bomb. Right? So that option was taken off the table. Uh, so, I, so that's actually the, the, the sort of immediate, if you will say, uh, narrow uh, importance of, of the nuclear deal. And at some level, you could look at it as essentially an arms control deal. Right? And we, we, we had signed similar deals with, with the Soviet Union 
at the height of the Cold War around uh, you know, reducing certain number of missiles, around uh, you know, certain weapon systems. And you could see this as a very narrow arms control deal. And actually, I think that's the way in which Iran's supreme leader, you know, its revolutionary guards, and maybe even some elements of the US administration saw this. It's a narrow deal dealing with a particular security military issue and nothing more. And you have to look at it only on the merits of whether it reduced the military threat that it intended to do, right? And, and you should judge it on that and not, not try to expand the mission of the nuclear deal as solving everything under the sun with Iran. And I think the US early on also made a very deliberate attempt that you cannot cut a deal with somebody if you put too many things on the table, right? They, they could say, well, we'll give, give something to you on Hezbollah, but not on, not on a nuclear deal. That you have to only deal with one issue and one issue alone. And so by, by design, Iran's regional role, Iran's support of uh, Hezbollah or Iran's human rights issues, domestic issues, were not on the table. This was only and only about the imminent threat of Iran going uh, uh, nuclear. And also, I think something else this nuclear deal achieved, particularly if you look at the news this week, there could have been a new North Korea scenario in which you keep sanctioning and they keep building, right? And, and, and the, the next phase would have been that uh, you know, Iran would actually have tested a weapon and you would have threatened them again and then they would have tested a better weapon and a smaller weapon and, 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 a, and a bigger weapon. I mean, in the end, with North Korea, we keep, we keep threatening. We say, if you, if you test the weapon, we're going to do this. And we don't do it. We can't do it. And then they test something bigger. And they test something more lethal. And then their missiles go further. So you know that scenario existed with Iran as well. And you could actually, I think, look at uh, this deal and say, what the United States has clearly not achieved with North Korea, at least took off the table uh, with Iran. However, if I were the North Koreans, and, I, and I'll explain, and I looked at what happened with Iran, I wouldn't necessarily go down the path of negotiation right now, because Iranians are not really happy campers, as uh, Ambassador Jerijian said, with, with where the deal uh, has gone. The other very big importance of the deal was that it was the very first time in close to four decades that Iran and the United States had actually directly negotiated about anything, actually met and talked openly about anything, and then actually signed a deal together. Iran, Iran has, had not signed a single deal of this significance with the United States in the close to 40 years of post-revolutionary history, and he had not signed a single deal on any security military issue, let alone nuclear issue, with anybody. And, all, and, and one of the big surprises was actually, was actually that Iran did implement the deal. And he actually implemented it ahead of time. I remember when the deal was signed, everybody in Washington said, well, the scenario shall be this, that Iranians are going to start slow rolling the implementation. They're going to come up with all kinds of excuses why they can't do it. And they're going to begin uh, testing how much they can cheat. And you know, we have to actually put a lot more inspectors on the ground. And, and the IAEA doesn't have enough inspectors. And, uh, and, and, and ultimately, the scenario was what the US had learned in Iraq and in North Korea. That they would sign a deal. They have no intention of implementing it. And uh, what we have to be focused on is, is actually the cheating part. And even the most optimistic members of the, of, the, of the US administration said, actually, Iran does not have the capability, the technical capability, to implement the deal in the time period that it has promised. So dismantling a plutonium plant is just too complicated. Uh, to be done in six months that they have promised. So they were also even trying to prepare the American public for why the deal may not be implemented by Iran. So Iran shocked the international community by actually implementing the deal and implementing it ahead of time, which was a very big surprise. And since then, actually, with every inspection of the IAEA, it has got a, a, you know, it has got a clean bill of health. That, 
despite some very minor things, there's no concern about Iran's implementation of the deal. I don't know how we, you take that to the bank and how do you build on that fact uh, going forward that they did sign a deal and in the end they did implement the deal. But I, I do think it has diplomatic value uh, in the future as we move forward and have to deal with them uh, on different occasions. It's a bit baffling about why they did it. Uh, because this would have required consensus across the security establishment and the political establishment in Iran and approval of the supreme leader to basically imp implement the deal very quickly. Uh, and finally, I think the deal was very significant because whereas the supreme leader in Iran and many in the U.S. administration tried to see the deal very narrowly as an arms control deal, I think the Iranian president... Uh, and, uh, and, and the faction in Iranian politics and Iranian society that he represents saw this deal as something a lot bigger. They didn't see it as an U.S.-Soviet Union deal. They saw it as Nixon going to China. They saw it as, 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 as something much bigger, a sort of passing of a, over a Rubicon in Iranian politics. Uh, they uh, actually uh, uh, took to what the Iranian president told them, that, that his mandate and, and his mission was to improve Iran's economy. And uh, to improve Iran's economy, Iran had to uh, do the nuclear deal in order to be able to engage the global economic community. And that not only would be materially beneficial to everybody, but actually it would, uh, it would ultimately open Iran. So I think two opinions in Iran began to rally to his support. One was Iranians who, uh, who generally were frustrated with, this, with, with Iran's economy, and whether they were hardliner, softliner, religious, secular, generally wanted uh, an improvement in the economic situation. And if uh, you know, temporary uh, uh, compromise on the nuclear deal would breathe life into Iran's economy. They were all for it. And then there was that l l group of Iranians which we had seen them on the streets in 2009 who literally are looking for uh, going past the Iranian revolution. And they want engagement with the world. They want a greater deal of normalization of relations uh, with, with the world. And they thought that, you know, that was happening. It's likely that the Iranian president oversold this story to the public or, that, or that, that group of people looking at President Obama, looking at his message, looking at the deal, also uh, read uh, uh, too much uh, into it. The next important issue that the deal caused, uh, it, it caused a major shift in the balance of power in the region. I think more psychologically in the minds of of uh, our Arab allies that is in fact the case. So, uh, you know, something like this was always gonna be a shock. Uh, you know, when, when, when Kissinger went to Ch China and when Nixon went to China, the word shock entered the Japanese language. as shoku, it became a word. Uh, they, they, they were shocked by uh, the sudden shift in US strategy going from containing China to engaging China. Something like that happened here. Because if you look at it, uh, uh, ever since the Iranian Revolution, I think the one of the fundamental tenets of American policy in the Middle East was containing Iran and building a very tight relationship with our Arab, Arab allies to contain Iran. There were many times in, in the past 40 years where the United States was holier than thou, was more committed to containment of Iran than Saudi Arabia or Qatar or, or UAE. They, always, they had embassies for most of these, this time period. Uh, they had relations. Uh, uh, and the US was the one which often encouraged them not to get clo too close to Iran. And the Arabs sort of had this splendid situation in which they had the benefit of American posture towards Iran. But they didn't have to work very hard for it. Uh, the US was automatically positioned against Iran. And the way they read it was that in one swoop, the US basically said that maybe containment of Iran is not the only way of dealing with Iran. 
And if the nuclear deal is actually successful, you have, an, you have at least proof of an alternate way of dealing with this country. And they were not at all happy with that, particularly because the next sentence in that was that the US is no longer really committed to defending uh, a balance of power in the Middle East that would favor the southern part of the Persian Gulf. And it actually may wish to be much more neutral in this. So if you thought about President Obama's uh, attempts to reassure the Arabs, what did he tell them? He said, I'm willing to give you $100 billion worth of weapons. Oh, that's great. But what that really means to them is that I'm, I don't want to defend you. We really don't want to defend you. We're willing to give you everything you want. You defend yourself, right? And then at insult to injury in an interview in the Atlantic magazine, he said, you know, the Saudis should learn to share the region with Iran. Where did that come from? I mean, the, the, the whole point, the point of US policy for decade was Iran is not even, shouldn't be in the region. It should stay in its own box. We're, we're going to be committed with aircraft carriers and bases and allies and all of that to build a Berlin Wall to keep Iran out of the Middle East. And now all of a sudden, the US is telling the Arabs, well, you got to share the region with, 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 with Iran. And, and you know, that, that, was a, that was a huge shock to them. And it, this, this came at, at a time when, I think in the perception of, for instance, Saudi Arabia, the Arab world itself had collapsed. It was in a free for all. So you know, Iraq and Syria, which are, you could think of them as the Germany or France of the Middle East, two massive countries in the region, even though they were not allies of the US, they nevertheless you know, were bastions of stability, actually at this point in time really are not countries anymore. They're not in control of their own territory. Large parts of their territory is controlled by a non-state actor. Uh, their future is, uh, is, is, uh, is in doubt. Egypt, which was a, a huge pillar of uh, Arab power in the region, has completely disappeared from, uh, from the map. I mean, it's internally focused. It's not engaged in, in, in the region. It doesn't have the ability to project power. And Saudi Arabia is desperately trying to show that it's up to the task of managing the region. But it really isn't, because Saudi Arabia always stood on the shoulder of these countries to do that. So there's a great deal of, if you would, sense of vulnerability at this point in time for the United States to be basically, you know, even 10 degree shift in American position has a tremendous amount of impact in the sense of, in, in the sense of you know, confidence, security that the Arab states uh, uh, feel. Uh, and uh, on the Iranian side too, the region was very important because whereas the Arabs, I think, want to say that Iran is winning in the region, I don't think the Iranians are as confident about uh, that scenario. So you know, they were dominant in Iraq until 2013, and then they lost lo control of large areas of, areas of Iraq to, to ISIS. They uh, were in control of all of Syria. And yes, they've been able to fight to keep the Assad regime in power, but they also have lost control of large areas of Syria. And they are not in control of what the future of Syria uh, would be. And they also have to you know, face uh, a, a very aggressive uh, Persian Gulf policy in Yemen, where you know, the Saudi Arabia and UAE have made a decision to use overt military force in, in, in settling the war in Yemen. And you know, if you're sitting in Tehran and you, ca you look, at the, look at the region, you see there are Sunni governments that are opposed to you. And then you see there's a Sunni force on the ground called ISIS, which is also opposed to you and is fighting you. And, and you're looking at a picture that is extremely hostile and, and difficult. And I think that was one reason I think the Iranian military and revolutionary guards were supportive of the nuclear deal. Because uh, you know, maybe neutralizing, pacifying the US, shifting the US's position was, was imperative. Iran would not be able to uh, fight this war in the Middle East under sanctions, and definitely would not be able to fight this war in the Middle East if it also had to think about Israeli airstrikes and you know, American pressure. So you could, you could basically say that uh, the strategic shift also happened in Iran. And then you saw it at play in Iraq. I mean, US and Iran 
don't want to admit, neither side wants to admit, that they actually have been collaborating in Iraq. I mean, there are cases of cities in Iraq that were liberated from ISIS with revolutionary ground-led forces and commanders on the ground and American airstrikes from above coordinated through Iraqi army or through the Kurdish uh, military. And, uh, and without, without one another's help, ISIS would have taken Iraq probably. And uh, so that, that strategic imperative of what is happening in the region is actually pretty important. And I think, I, I think one of the ironies of Saudis escalating pressure on Iran is actually is pushing the Iranians much more to think in terms of uh, uh, how they think about the United States and how do they go forward. Now, um, the, the deal, um, as I said, uh, has been much more successful here, even though you know, presidential candidates, et cetera, criticize it. But it has been a spectacular deal insofar as what the US wanted and what the US got. That's actually not true on the Iranian side. So initially, you know, reports were that Iran is going to get $150 billion out of the deal. Uh, in one uh, event, uh, Secretary Kerry uh, said very affirmatively that all the money Iran has got from the deal is $3 billion. And even this cash that was given to Iran in this sort of very uh, uh, you know, questionable uh, way or midnight on a plane in, in, in Geneva, even the $1.7 billion is not really material in a, in a significant way to Iran. I mean, the amount Iran spends on Syria on an annual basis is multiples of 10 of that, of that number, probably. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and so the, the perception in Iran is that it hasn't been a good deal. Uh, first thing is, as a consequence of the deal, uh, the United States has given close to $100 billion worth of weapons to uh, Iran's regional rivals. So Iran thinks they are the big winners out of the deal, even though they complain. Uh, and, and secondly is that Iran really has not got economic benefits from the deal. So uh, one of the things that's happened is that um, Iran as a country may not be sanctioned, but all the transactions that you need to do to do business with Iran are sanctioned. And uh, it's the State Department that negotiated the deal with Iran. It's the Treasury that is in charge of implementing the US as part of the deal. And the Treasury is not really uh, moving on this. And, um, and I don't think, my view is that President Obama is not incentivized to do anything more for this deal than he has already, because he's already got everything he wants from the deal which is it's a victorious deal for him. And in fact, the narrative that US has got everything and Iran hasn't got anything, uh, which is attested to by Iranians themselves, is perfectly fine for President Obama. I mean, that's the last thing you know, uh, he, he would want to be able to uh, say is that the deal was, uh, was uh, Iranians can claim some kind of an advantage out of the deal. And there's plenty of evidence for it. I mean, even today, uh, Iran's, one of Iran's top nuclear uh, uh, um, negotiators said that Iran has done all of its part, the US hasn't. Uh, when the prime minister of Italy went to Tehran, the supreme leader in a very uh, um, uh, unique case uh, gave him an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, which uh, protocol did not require the prime minister to be seen by the supreme leader. And the entire hour and 45 minutes was spent on the supreme leader complaining about the United States not fulfilling its economic obligations under the deal and actively discouraging other countries from doing business with Iran. And I think he did that because he knew the, president, the prime minister of Italy would call President Obama directly. He want, what he wanted to say is that I don't want you to hear it from my foreign minister or president where you can say they're being dramatic. You're going to hear it from me, and we're not happy. Uh, and, and, and that's actually important. Uh, it, it may be good news here because it might actually make the deal last longer, and, and the Iranians themselves are attesting to the fact that they haven't got anything out of the deal. But it's actually dangerous for Iran uh, because um, uh, there, is a, there, there is an important election coming up in Iran in June for the presidency. And uh, 
I think uh, you know, the conservatives in Iran were very nervous when the deal was signed because they thought that if Iran's uh, president can be an economic rainmaker and if he actually can show the public that he has delivered on the economy and perhaps he can even open up the country and normalize relations, he may become unstoppable. And they actually had a warning shot when uh, a few months back in the parliamentary elections, uh, the president of Iran won, I mean his supporters won the parliament. And most uh, significantly, they won all 30 seats uh, from the capital city Tehran to the parliament, which is unprecedented. And they bulldozed over significant uh, conservative candidates that, who, whose, whose defeat in the election was humiliating to the conservatives. And in the same election for a Supreme Council of Experts that uh, would, would choose the next Supreme Leader, one of the most important councils in Iran, two of Iran's most significant conservative ayatollahs lost their seats. I mean, there's no way in the Iranian context you can, you can sugarcoat that development. It was a significant outcome. And, um, and, 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 and the fear in Iran was that this might get repeated in June elections for the presidency. And in Iran, actually, maybe the belief is that Iran's president is clever enough to know that he's not going to do any political reform until he's reelected. That the first term was for economic issues and for the nuclear deal. But if he comes in with a strong enough a mandate, then he may begin to bear down um, on some more serious issues. And you know, he's already shown it. Uh, he's already started tackling the Revolutionary Guard's budget in Iran, in Iran's parliament. And that's one of the reasons why you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, activity on, on their part. Now, because the deal is not producing anything, his opponents have found a perfect, uh, perfect lever. A, to argue that the deal was bogus. So we cashiered the entire nuclear program. We, we, we sacrificed all of this, and we've got $1.7 billion, and uh, nothing more has happened, and nothing more is likely to happen. And that's under a president that supposedly is much more forward-leaning in the deal. The other two that are waiting to come are, are hardly give uh, uh, you know, Iranians reason to be optimistic uh, uh, about, about the issue. Uh, but, but actually, the, 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 now the campaign has escalated further, arguing that, um, uh, you know, uh, the, that um, the Iranian president and his uh, foreign minister were actually uh, didn't know what to ask for at the negotiating table. They were naive. And this reached the point that the Supreme Leader two weeks ago publicly said, my criticism is not of our negotiations team is of the duplicity of the other side. You know, he, he felt compelled, he needed to clarify himself. Uh, that that's the degree of, of, of problem. And I think the next level, which we're seeing some signs of it, is that the conservatives are pointed to the fact that the entire, entire uh, negotiation process was an effort at regime change in Iran, and that uh, the negotiation team was, uh, was filled with uh, uh, um, uh, you know, spies and traitors who, who sold the country at the negotiations table. And by implication, that would, uh, uh, you know, that narrative, once it takes hold, uh, could be very problematic uh, for, the, for the Iranian uh, president. So ironically, the, you know, we may end up with this deal that, that the US got out of the deal what it wanted, but the interlocutors that it, it, it did this deal with may end up being sacrificed by by the US policy, and those are actually the ones that uh, we would like to actually empower in Iran. And we're already seeing signs of what happens if Rouhani goes. So aggressive you know, uh, uh, threats to US Navy on the Persian Gulf, uh, giving uh, uh, access to Iranian air bases uh, to Russia. I mean, if, if Rouhani goes, if the conservatives, if the revolutionary guards in a much more clear way take over power, uh, that's, that's the sort of shade of Iran uh, that we're likely to see. Anyways, let me stop here. I'd be very happy to hear your, your questions and thoughts. Thank you.
Thank you for that talk. Um, you alluded to the use of uh, Iranian air bases by Russia at the end of your talk, and I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about what you think this deal looked like from the perspective of the Russians. You know, Iran and Russia have had actually a strategic relationship for some time. It's not just about Syria. They have jointly managed Central Asia and Caucasus for about 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, even during the nuclear period, there were certain agreements between uh, Russia and Iran over, uh, over how uh, you know, Russia would act at the United Nations and the like. In Syria, they have found a much more clear reason why they need to collaborate, which is around uh, keeping uh, Bashar Assad in power and defeating the opposition. But, they, but, but I think the, the scope of this relationship is much broader. The, the Russians are clearly coming to the Middle East. And they're, 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 they're eager to be seen as an actor in the region. Uh, they see the United States uh, withdrawing from the region, taciturn. It doesn't want to get involved in, in Syria. Its, it's uh, relationship with its Arab allies has now become uh, uh, distant. And, and it's an opportunity for, for Russia to come in in a, in a big way uh, uh, in the region. And so they see Iran essentially as now a drift. You know, the US has not done enough with the nuclear deal to keep Iran hooked on. Uh, on the other hand, Iran has no other essentially uh, partner in the region, and it might need, need the Russians. And it's a country of 80 million. It's, it's a huge asset, you know, once you put your hooks in it. Uh, it could be a, a, a much more lucrative base for Russia than Syria was, and it's a much more stable country than uh, Syria was. For Iran, you know, Iranians are looking at, as I said, as a massive assault across the region on their equities. Now, whether this is right or wrong, that's the way they see it. So they're they're seeing ISIS and 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 uh, the Victory Front and. Uh, in Syria, uh, uh, and then you, you have tribes and generally angry Sunnis about Iranian meddling across the region, and then you have r governments in the region that have become very openly hostile uh, to Iran. So Iran needs, needs somebody, needs, needs, a, needs, a, needs a friend, needs a protector, needs a source of weapons, needs a, a, a strategic supporter, and the Russians have raised their hand. Uh, and, uh, and, are, and are willing uh, to play that role. So, so I think, uh, and actually, I, I think as uh, the Iranians are gonna see a more aggressive, maybe US policy under a President Clinton or a President Trump, I think they, they're going to find it much more uh, uh, important to find cover uh, of, of support from Russia. Uh, so, so I think this is going to continue. And, and, and you know, the, the, the base issue, uh, was suspended largely because the Iranian parliament demanded to have a vote. And that uh, ended up being an inconvenient intrusion by the legislature, as it might happen here also, uh, because there's an article of the Iranian constitution that, that does not allow the government to, to give uh, territory to a foreign power without at least explicit consultation and vote of the parliament. So they found it's better to just call this a one-time short-term engagement and send the planes home. But you know, there's plenty of evidence and hints that commanders have made that uh, exigent circumstances may require the return of, of, of Russian bombers. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, um, the presidential election that's coming up the future and what the Iranian election, uh, and what that could mean for the Iran deal as far as using it as a leverage to create diplomacy in the Middle East. Um, I know last year I was working with Congress to push the deal through, so one talking point that we always had was that it would create peace and not war and uh, help create diplomacy, but we still see Iran involved in Syria, and as you mentioned earlier. So I was wondering if you could address that um, and whether it looks like they could help at all with the Syria situation? Uh, you know, I, I, I think actually, uh, of, of course, Iran is going to be a big uh, presidential uh, um, you know, uh, issue in the campaign. But I don't, I, I don't think during the campaign we're going to see much disagreement between the two candidates uh, other than how hard they're going to be on Iran. 
I think the key is when they come to power, uh, what sort of policy they would adopt with Iran. I do not think the United States will will tear up the, uh, the nuclear deal because it's not to the advantage of the United States to tear up a deal that the Iranians have implemented and they haven't implemented. So, you know, tearing it up actually would relieve the Iranians to say, okay, we just go back to doing what? We didn't walk away, you walked away, right? So I don't think they're gonna tear up the deal. But I also think that the next administration is gonna quickly find out that United States and Iran are not sort of suspended in space confronting each other, they're in a context. So the US cannot address Syria and Iraq without Iran, at least getting them to the table, getting them sorted out. And, and uh, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the Russia issues is are gonna be important to the US. S security in the Gulf is gonna be important to the US. And, and US would have to make a decision that it is gonna go into the region again in big numbers, or is it gonna look for a peace deal, for instance, in Syria? A peace deal, Whatever its final outcome is requires you know, engaging the Iranians. When, the nego when you took the deal to Congress, I think the purpose of the deal was to deal only and only with the nuclear issue. You might have thought that there might be some uh, sort of goodwill that comes out of the deal and you could then engage the Iranians further. Partly that didn't happen because the deal made the, our Arab allies even more resistant to talking to Iran, right? Uh, because they thought that, okay, the deal, then Syria, then next what? You're gonna negotiate over us with them. So they basically tried to draw a line in the sand and, and actually the Saudis continued to resist even inviting Iran uh, to, to uh, Geneva talks. Uh, and, I, and I think, end of the day, we decided that, you know, we'll talk to the Russians, maybe the Russians will talk to the Iranians. Um, but, but whether you look at Iran, you look at Turkey, you look at Saudi Arabia, you know, their, their, their purpose and equities and fears in Syria has not gone away. And this, in my opinion, is not about Assad or the opposition. This is about how each of these countries will end up in the pecking order in the Middle East, right? So the Iranians defend Assad partly because if Assad goes, they know then Lebanon would go and Iraq would go. Right? This is a sort of a Alamo for them. They have to, they have to defend this, uh, you know, come hell or high water. And I think the Saudis are committed to removing Iran uh, from Syria, and, and that's symbolized in Assad. In fact, if Assad goes, another Alawite comes, they could still claim victory that Iran didn't get its way. So it's become about these two, and, and that's not gonna go away unless the United States actively tries to reduce tensions between those two countries. Uh, you know, the nuclear deal escalated the tensions, but we haven't done anything to mitigate it. Thank you. Very informative presentation. I'm a, my name is Walter Light, and I'm an independent geologist. And uh, I haven't heard anything about the implications of this deal and the go forward in terms of the oil and gas sector mm -hmm. and its implications. Kind of two part questions. And do you think that? Russia moving in there, trying to get its claws into Iran, has something to do with constraining the gas fields uh, in Iran and keeping them off the market uh, in a global sense and letting Russia and whatever mark continue to market to Europe. Well, uh, you know, the Russians have to give Iranians a lot to, in the long term, keep them out of the, out of the uh, gas market. But the R Russians are happy to, for Iran to sell to the east. They just don't want the Iranians to sell to Europe because the Russians want to hope, hold a chokehold on Europe. Uh, years ago, um, uh, uh, Putin offered the supreme leader that if Iran agreed not to join any sale of gas to Europe, Russia would veto United Nations Security Council sanctions against Iran. That was how important it was. Um, but uh, I think in the uh, shorter run, it's not just about ga oil and gas. Now, oil itself is, is part of this um, uh, picture. Uh, you know, if you believe that uh, oil prices are likely to remain uh, low for some time to come, which is what many analysts uh, say, and a lot, a lot of it has to do because of what Texas is doing technologically with shale oil, if it stays around $50 a barrel and the like, it will have a profound impact 
uh, on, on the Middle East. I mean, already it has to do with psychologically with Saudi Arabia's feeling that it has been downsized in America's view. Right? We don't think it's the indispensable oil power or that we need it. Uh, and, and, and therefore, we feel a lot more comfortable uh, you know, passing legislation for uh, families of 9-11 victims to sue them or to criticize them for supporting extreme th kinds of things that didn't used to uh, happen. So in their, in their sense, it's very, it's very clear that you know, this, this perception of, of oil independence in the US and low oil prices has, has hit them in terms of their standing. Uh, if, if the oil prices remain low, there's going to be regime change in many countries in the region, uh, largely because, uh, you know, even look at Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia at, at $50 an oil, uh, you know, is going to run through its, all of its sovereign fund, wealth fund reserves within five to six years. If it, if it uh, uh, resorts to the kinds of reforms and fiscal changes that the current uh, power broker in Saudi Arabia, uh, the, the, the king's son, Mohammed bin Salman, is arguing, we don't know of any country around the world who has done this kind of economic restructuring which has not had regime change, right? Whether it's Argentina or Philippines or Thailand or Poland. I mean, you know, the shock to the Saudi system is not going to be uh, easy uh, uh, to manage. If they don't, uh, uh, you know, cut spending, then you know they're going to, you know, be, gradually incur a lot of debt, and and uh, you know the the profile of the country is going to change uh, significantly. Saudi Arabia also underwrites a lot of other governments in the region, and if those payments begin to dwindle because of low oil prices, money to Jordan, to Egypt, to Morocco. You know, you're going to see impact there as well. Iran, too, uh, uh, cannot live at the economic level that has lived this far. I mean, that was one reason they came to the, to the, to the negotiating table for a nuclear deal. I mean, they were basically accepting the fact that you know, they can't do it anymore. The one difference, I would say, between Saudi Arabia and Iran at this point in time is that much like we used to say about the Russians, Iranians know how to suffer, right? They have been doing it. Uh, low oil prices will cause disgruntlement. Probably, I believe would eventually force the regime to open up a lot more. Uh, but, but they have been under uh, heavy uh, economic pressure for a long time. Uh, Saudi Arabia is not used to that. I mean, if you were to lay off large numbers of people, cut their entitlement spending, you know, that, that is, there's no way that that won't have political uh, implications. So the longer range is uh, low oil prices will be consequential. I mean, let's not forget, uh, Ir Iran's revolution happened after an oil shock. And it did have to do with, to some extent, with the oil shock. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is going to be important, yeah. Uh, as you know, during the President Khatami's time, Iran signed an agreement with three European countries to totally freeze their in, uh, uranium enrichment. And in fact, they did it so well for two years. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, by the pressure from the United States, they did not fulfill their agreement, and Iran, after two years, they started resuming uh, enrichment from almost nothing to, all, uh, to about uh, 20,000 uh, centrifuges when they signed the agreement uh, lately. So my question is, in the short run, I think US or West might think that they won this agreement. They are not going to fulfill their agreement. And after a while, Iran is going to reach to a point and come back and again start. And um, at that time, they may even go to a weapon because it's the twice U.S. did not fulfill their uh, agreement. It's not Iran. Well, uh, possibly. I mean, you know, 15 years or five years is a long time. Right. A lot can happen. Uh, yes, it's possible that Iranians may go back, but, but uh, I, I think for them right now, it's a very, very difficult situation because 
they have already accepted the cost of the deal, but they haven't got the benefit from it either. If they walk away from the deal, they absolutely have no hope of getting anything from it at all. And the cost of rebooting, going back to the, where they were, is going to be extremely expensive. It's not as easy to sort of just go back uh, to, to where they were. Uh, the Iranians point out continuously, Iran's foreign minister always points out that the 2003 deal, you know, we had only 200 centrifuges, now we have 20,000 centrifuges. But you know, in reality, both countries were in a different place. Uh, Iran was not as hard pressed to necessarily agree to implementation. The US could look at 200 centrifuges and say, well, you know, that's not really a threat. We can ask for more. Uh, you, we could say in hindsight that that was a mistake, but that sort of is water under the bridge right now. I think you know, in reality, they, they, did, they did get to sign a deal now, and they have to, both sides have to look at uh, uh, making this successful. If it fails, uh, then you know, all, all sorts of things, scenarios could happen. And if Iran sticks with this for 15 years, uh, you know, 15 years, as I said, is a very long time. The Middle East may be in a very different place in 15 years, and, and Iran itself may be in a, in a different place in 15 years. So, so the deal has basically bought time, let's put it that way. But I do think that if, if this deal were to unravel, it would be a, it would be a disaster for both countries. Great talk, thanks. Um, do you think the military aid deal which is signed today between U.S. and Israel will have any impact on this? Well, you know, in Iran they may think that uh, that, that makes Israel more powerful. I, I think they're going to look at, you know, what is being sold and whether Israel would, might use that in Lebanon or what kind of a capability would it give to Israeli Air Force. Uh, generally, the Iranians basically think that the nuclear deal has been a fantastic opportunity for America's allies because the U.S. decided to buy their uh, acquiescence to the deal with huge um, uh, uh, you know, aid agreements, weapons agreements, and the more they cried foul, the bigger the deal they got, which is one of the reasons you see Iran is escalating its investment in missile technology or, or uh, getting closer to Russia because they, they do think that uh, these things do, do uh, matter. But I think most immediately, the impact of that deal is domestic for the US. I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, the Obama administration would like to leave office with the impression that it has repaired uh, fraught relations with Israel. And I think uh, they would like to hand over the reign to another democratic administration with a relationship that's already on the rebound. And it would be easier for President Obama to negotiate this deal, particularly now when the attention of everybody's on the election, that let's say a new Clinton administration was coming in and doing it. And I think it would have been worse for Democrats if a Republican administration came in and, and had the pretense of fixing a, a, a relationship that was broken by Democrats. So, so I think it, it has a lot more to do, the timing has a, and the size has a lot more to do with what President Obama wants to make as a statement. People may say a lot of things about his relationship with Israel, but what he is leaving behind is that I signed the biggest aid deal in Israel's history. And that's, I think, the operative fact that he wants to leave at the table as he leaves. Uh, we have been told that uh, after the fact that there were several side in uh, secret deals, how can the Iranian population and the American population make a good judgment on the merits of this deal without knowing what all has transpired? You know, actually, sometimes if deals are completely secret, it's much better. Um, I mean, you see the final result, but, but if, but if uh, say, when uh, Kissinger was going to China, if, if it was all public then, it wouldn't have happened. You know, the, that whole secret negotiations led to something bigger. And sometimes secret negotiations fail and you want to just keep it that way, and sometimes they succeed. Uh, yes, there are perhaps uh, uh, secret parts to this deal, but it's not about the core issue, which is the nuclear deal. 
I mean, that part is uh, the, the terms that the two sides have to observe and, and implement is very much in the open. Now, if an American official had told the Iranians, don't worry, I'll get Boeing to sell you planes uh, if you do X, Y, and Z, uh, you know, yes, maybe they said that, uh, and maybe that's one reason why the Iranians are very unhappy, because th those deals are not, are not happening. I actually think uh, um, you know, the, the, the part about these, the money being given to Iran, uh, my theory is, I don't want to say this is the case, is that because the United States actually is unwilling uh, to lift uh, sanctions that allow banks to do business with Iran, you can't actually pay Iran. You know, Secretary Kerry went to London and met with the chairmen and CEOs of all the major European banks, UBS, you know, uh, uh, Credit Suisse, Barclays, all of them. I mean, the first thing they told them is, why are you here? Why the Secretary of Treasury is not here? Because you can say anything you want, but he's the one who's going to punish us. Uh, when, when if, we, if we transact with an Iranian bank that maybe is 50% owned by Revolutionary Guards or doesn't have international standards, or you can claim Iran is a sponsor of terrorism, et cetera, the Treasury can immediately come and punish us. So you know what? We don't want to do business with Iran until you lift, uh, you know, specifically give us a letter from the Treasury that says we can transfer this money. So uh, the Iranians saw no money was coming. I think they basically said, well, you know, if you want these Iranian Americans released, you need to give this at least our own cash. And the administration had no way of actually paying them other than literally giving them cash. I know it looks uh, uh, odd, but, but it actually is part of what was agreed on the deal, which is Iranian money sitting in outside banks uh, would be unfrozen, and Iran would have access to them and would be able to move them to banks that it wanted. Now, the bank said, it's great you made that deal, but we don't want to be a part of this. So it's kind of like trying to make water flow without plumbing. You just got to get a bucket and carry it over and give it to the other side. Um, but, but, but exactly, it's not tenable. I mean, you did, this was a one-time one -time action. So you know, it's not going to work anymore uh, unless something bigger opens up. Thanks very much for a superb talk. I might perhaps change subjects uh, marginally and ask you to give a short analysis of the state of play in Afghanistan and Pakistan. How would you rate progress or regression from your time working with the administration to today? And then perhaps take the longer view. Is there hope in what seems to be a pretty intractable area of the world? Are you optimistic or pessimistic going forward? Well, in the short run, I'm actually pessimistic about Afghanistan. I mean, Pakistan is part of that picture. But uh, you know, we got we we started in, in Afghanistan with the idea that uh, we're going to defeat the insurgency. Then the administration got to a point uh, very early on that said there is such a thing as called Afghanistan good enough, uh, which is you know you 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 can uh, reduce the temperature of the insurgency to a certain extent, then you're going to create an Afghan security force that's going to take over from you, and then we're actually going to do the the Iraq model, which is go down to zero. And I think, I personally think that's a fundamental mistake. Because if you look at post-conflict situations, unless you stay, uh, you know, peace and security can unravel. You know, we're still in Bosnia, we're still in Korea, we're still in Japan, we're still in Germany, uh, but in Iraq, two years out, we went to zero. And in Afghanistan, that was the same idea, except I think Afghanistan was lucky that ISIS happened in Iraq, because then the administration panicked and uh, slowed down the rate of uh, withdrawal, and, and in fact now has suggested that you know, there might be even more advisors for the Afghan uh, troops going forward. But, but the picture in Afghanistan is actually very negative. The Taliban are taking back the Helmand province, which was the center of the fighting that the US fought tooth and nail to push the Taliban out of Helmand. They literally have taken over Helmand. They are hitting Kabul at will, any, any target, anywhere. And then we brokered a marriage between um, 
uh, you know, current president Ashraf Ghani and, and the contender Abdullah Abdullah into this sort of a bizarre relationship that one is president, the other one's CEO. I don't know what a CEO of a country means, but uh, we, te- we invented it for Afghanistan of all places. But they don't get along, and uh, they don't get along because these kinds of scenarios would never work. Uh, uh, they are from two different ethnic groups. They have their own ambitions. That's also coming apart uh, at the center. So, so that governing formula is not working. The Taliban are surging. And, uh, and, and before long, we have to pay attention to it. Now, Afghanistan is another arena that the US will engage Iran, because it has no other option than Iran. Iran is a huge player in Afghanistan. The two countries that matter to Afghanistan's future are Pakistan and Iran. Pakistan is on the wrong side of this conflict as far as we're concerned. It's always been, we don't believe it's completely changed. We need to bang on it to not support the Taliban. But the Iranians basically are, uh, are, are on the side, have always been on the side of you know, the, the, the nor- what used to be the Northern Alliance is the sort of the force that's behind the government. You can't manage Afghanistan without Iran. And, uh, and, and so as the temperature goes up, you're going to have another venue, much like Iraq, that the US will have to go back to uh, find a way to talk to Iran. Now, one of the benefits of the nuclear deal is that the taboo of talking to Iran is broken. It's much easier to say, OK, we need to talk to them. Uh, or you know, foreign minister level, deputy foreign minister level. It's a conference on Afghanistan. You need to invite them. Uh, but whether we can arrive at an agreement, what sort of an agreement, you know, that, that remains to be seen. Thank you.